My name is Rick Renner, and I'm seated on one of the original seats in the upper theater of ancient Pergamum. Pergamum had several theaters, but this was the upper theater, and in the first century, it seated 10,000 spectators who came to see the show. Well, from this seat, you can see a beautiful valley. In fact, the view is just spectacular. But the valley is really not what they came to see. They came to see the show, which was performed on the stage below. And the Greeks just loved the theater. And the theater was a very dignified place where you could hear poetry and drama and prose. It was really a place of great entertainment. But by the time you come to the Roman period in the first century, when the church was growing here, the theater had become a pretty disgusting place. All kinds of sexual behavior, crude language, vulgar conversation, and a lot of mocking of political leaders and making politically correct statements back in those times, just like they're trying to do today. And in fact, the theater became so disgusting, Christians said, enough of that, we won't participate. And if you had come here in the first century and had seen all the people packed into this theater, you wouldn't have found a single Christian in the whole crowd because the Christians said, we don't need it. We don't condone that behavior. We don't condone that kind of language. And we don't believe you should mock other people. So the Christians refrained from entertainment because they believed they were called to live by a higher standard. And they were misunderstood by the pagans because they refrained from that part of society. The pagans would say, what's wrong with these Christians? Can't they even go to the show? Are they not normal people? But the Christians understood those kinds of things were not made for their eyes and their ears. They were the temples of the Holy Spirit, and they were not going to participate in these base activities. So they withdrew from entertainment. Christ may call on you to take a stand for certain things in your life that people may not understand. It's okay if people don't understand. What's important is that you do what pleases the Lord. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to the program. I'm so excited to jump right into Revelation chapter 2, picking up where we left off yesterday, where we were talking about the prophet Balaam in the Old Testament. You know, in the introduction to today's program, I was sitting in the upper theater in Pergamum talking about how the early believers lived separately from the world. Christ calls us to live a life of separation. We're in the world, but we're not to be a part of the world. But in the church of Pergamum, there was a group of erring leaders who begin to say, well, we need to compromise, lower our standards. Why are we so separate from pagans? If we would just be a little more friendly and accommodating and accepting of them and what they do and what they believe and their lifestyles, then they would be kinder toward us. And they begin to water down the teachings of the Bible and of the gospel. Christ was against it. He likened it to the doctrine of Balaam and he called it the teachings of the Nicolaitans. And today we're going to be dealing with that and in the next two programs. It's going to be really good. So stay with me all the way to the end. And remember that if you need prayer, we are waiting for your contact. We want to hear from you. We want to know how to pray for you. And I promise you, if you contact us, we will really pray. And I want to remind you that I'm offering you my series called Christ's Message to Pergamum. It's a 10-part series based on these programs. It really is the result of me going to Pergamum many, many times to study on-site, in-field research. Amazing. Amazing. I love the city of Pergamum. And what Christ said to the church of Pergamum really has application for you and me today. You need to hear these messages. And they come with a marvelous study guide that you will devour. You can use this with a friend, just by yourself, or you could use it with a Bible study group. And it would be a great gift to give to anybody who loves the teaching of the Bible. But we're also offering you my book called No Room for Compromise. The subtitle is Christ's Message to Today's Church. This book is amazing. It's full color. And as I've told you before, I wrote this book the way that I think a book should be written. It's not just text. It is fully illustrated. It is full color to make the teaching of the Bible literally step off the page into your imagination. This book is just amazing. And as you study it and use it, and you will use it over and over and over because really it's a resource, 
you're going to be so glad you got this book. So I want you to order it. And today, I'm going to be reading from this book because I can't improve on what I wrote. So forgive me for reading, but I think that you're going to be glad I did. Today we're going to be talking about Balaam. And we're going to pick up again in Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. And in Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, Jesus says to the church in Pergamum, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold to the doctrine of Balaam. We've seen that this word doctrine is the Greek word didache, and the word didache is used in this verse, describes not only the teaching, but the method to apply the teaching. It is information and application. And what you're going to find out today from Scripture, the doctrine of Balaam, was when Balaam took to his side King Balak, a Moabite king, he told Balak how to destroy God's people Israel. And he didn't just tell him, then he said, now, let me take you as an apprentice. I want to give you the method to do this. He gave him a strategic plan how to destroy God's people. It was teaching with a method to carry it out. This was the doctrine of Balaam. But let's keep looking at Balaam for a few moments. Balaam was an Old Testament pagan priest. He was not a prophet of God, contrary to what many people say. The name Balaam itself means in relationship with Baal, kinsman of Baal. He was connected to the god Baal. He was a false prophet. Another form of the name Balaam means a loner, somebody who is mysterious. This was a mysterious man connected to Baal. This was a false prophet. And even early Jewish commentaries tell us that. We saw that Philo, who was a leading intellectual in the city of Alexandria in Egypt, which was Cleopatra's Alexandria, a city filled with witchcraft and sorcery, the Jews who lived there knew all about that. They'd seen it, they'd grown up with it, they'd studied it, they couldn't help it, they lived in that environment. And Philo, who understood what a diviner was, listen to what he wrote. Philo wrote that Balaam was a man renowned above all men for his skill as a diviner. He called him a diviner, not a prophet of God. Josephus, Josephus is the most famous Jewish historian who has ever lived. The state of Israel today still considers Josephus to be the most authoritative voice outside the Bible on Jewish history. And Josephus wrote, that Balaam was among the greatest prophets at that time. Wow. He lived concurrently with Moses. So that's quite a statement. Moses was an instrument for the power of God, but Balaam was an instrument for the power of darkness. Now, both Philo and Josephus call him a prophet, and that confuses people. But they use the word prophet in a sense like it was used even among pagans. A prophet back in those days was anyone that was a voice for the spirit realm. Didn't necessarily mean a prophet of God. A prophet was just anyone who was a voice for the spirit realm. Well, that connects to the word diviner because the word diviner can also be described in other ways. For example, a diviner is a foreteller, a seer, soothsayer, a consulter, a familiar spirits, an enchanter, a necromancer. He is a wizard, a witch, a voice through which the spirit realm speaks. A diviner was a medium or a clairvoyant. Now, if you take the writings of the New Testament, and by the way, Numbers chapter 22 and verse 7 tells us explicitly that Balaam was a diviner. He was a clairvoyant. He was a medium. He was a witch. That's what he was. He was not just a false prophet. He was a witch. He was an instrument for the spirit realm, the dark spirit realm. Well, we know a lot about how diviners practiced divination. And I want to read to you from my book. Ancient diviners used a variety of occult practices to see the future. But one especial common practice was to slaughter an animal, then spread its entrails on an altar and attempt to read the future by analyzing the scattered organs. Wow. Numbers 23 tells us that Balaam accompanied King Balak to multiple mountaintops to offer animal sacrifices before he attempted to curse Israel. This fact has led many scholars to speculate that Balaam may have been attempting to read the entrails of the animals 
that he had killed. What you read about him offering these sacrifices, they were not sacrifices to God. This was an occult practice. It was very easy. Balaam was so well known during his time that Balak had sent his emissaries nearly 400 miles to fetch Balaam and bring him back. And Balaam at first did not want to come. So the Bible tells us that King Balak enticed him by offering him a house full of silver and gold. And when Balaam heard that, he bit the bait. He traveled all the way to King Balak to begin the process of cursing Israel. Now listen careful. Balaam was revered as a great diviner and soothsayer known for his supposed abilities to curse or to bless. That is why Numbers 22 verse 6, King Balak said to Balaam, For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. That was Balaam's reputation. But in spite of his reputation, there's not a single biblical record that confirms Balaam possessed the ability to bless or curse anyone. According to the Talmud, which was an ancient Jewish authoritative text, Balaam simply had the unique ability to discern when God's judgment was en route to a person, to a city, or to a nation. Balaam had enough sense to know that when people violated divine principles, they were going to be judged. He knew that. So Balaam would analyze the situation, and if Balaam saw that a person, a city, or a nation, a people, were violating a divine principle, then he knew the judgment was coming. And rather than tell them to repent and behave correctly, he seized the opportunity and he would say, I'm going to speak a judgment on these people. He had nothing to do with the judgment was already coming because they had violated principles. But he seized the moment to promote himself as a great cursor. And remember, the one of his names means the swallower or the devourer of people. And because he was able to prognosticate whenever judgment was coming, and before the judgment came, he would then stand and say, I'm going to curse this people. It made it look like he was bringing the curse. And when the curse came, it was because of his words. He was just a charlatan taking advantage of the situation. He had no ability to curse. He had no ability to bless. None whatsoever. There's not an evidence of that in Scripture. And the Bible tells us that he tried three times to curse Israel. And finally... He said in Numbers chapter 23, verse 8, How shall I curse him whom the Lord has not cursed? Or how shall I defy him who the Lord has not defied? There was no curse in root to Israel. And so he couldn't feign to be a curser. He couldn't curse whom the Lord had not cursed. He couldn't defy whom the Lord had not defied. But when Balaam realized Israel could not be cursed, he still went with Balak to those mountaintops to make sacrifices, hoping that a door to the spirit realm would open and through the act of divination, he would somehow be able to bring something evil on the people of Israel. After failing repeatedly to place a curse on Israel, Balaam conceded that divination was no match for the power of God. It was at this point that he told King Balak, listen to this, Numbers 23, verse 23, and this is a good message for you. Listen to this. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. You see, Satan has no power against the church. Satan really has no authority against God's people. And I want you to claim this verse. There's no enchantment against you. There's no divination against you. You are God's child. Therefore, this reminder about Balaam, one of history's most famous sorcerers who was unable to penetrate God's protective shield about his people, should be a reminder to you and me, Satan has no powers against us. Even though there are some who allege the people involved in the occult have the power to curse believers. The scripture clearly teaches no one has the power or ability to curse what God has blessed. And if you are in Christ and walking in obedience to God's word, you are safe, secure, sealed in the protective blood of Jesus and the power of that divine protection 
can never be breached by someone operating with Satan's powers. The occult has never been and will never be a match for the power of God inside a believer. And this is precisely why the Apostle John wrote in John 4, verse 4, 1 John 4, For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The story of Balaam serves as a reminder to God's people that Satan may be the God of the unbelieving world and exert a measure of power over them, but he does not have power over you. What God has blessed is blessed, and this fact cannot be reversed. Now that is encouraging. But when Balaam realized he couldn't curse the people of God, he didn't stop. He took the next step. He said, hey, Balak, I know how to do this. I can't curse them with divination, divination. So let me tell you how we're going to destroy God's people. You see, he really wanted that house full of gold and silver. So he didn't give up. He introduced a doctrine and then told Balaam, Balak how to carry it out. What happened? Well, the Bible tells us. It says that he taught Balak how to destroy God's people. What did he do? Look at verse 14. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. The word cast is from the Greek word balo. It means to throw or to hurl. It carries the idea of an element of surprise. The word stumbling block is the Greek word scandalon, which was used to describe a trap to catch an animal. And here's the way the trap worked. A trap was propped up with a piece of wood. A piece of food was placed under it to lure the animal into the trap. When the animal entered the trap and bumped the piece of wood, the trap would fall and the animal would be entrapped. In the New Testament, this word stumbling block, the Greek word scandalon, is usually used to describe an enticement to sin. The devil lures you into his trap and then he catches you or he entraps you in sin. What happened? Well, the Bible tells us what exactly was the trap that Balaam taught Balak to use against the Israelites. Well, there's something else first you need to see in verse 14. Revelation 2.14 says to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. The word before, the Greek word enopion, which means within the eyesight of. It's the picture of dangling a bait in front of somebody to lure them out. Hmm. So Balaam said to Balak, we've got to lure the people of Israel out. We need to first of all cast a stumbling block in front of them. We've got to take them with an element of surprise, put something in front of them that lures them out. Well, the Bible tells us what happened in Numbers 25, verses 1 through 3. It says, an Israel boat in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called unto the people under the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat, and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Let's look at this verse one more time. It says, And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. Okay. And the people did eat. Okay. Then they bowed down to their gods. Okay. Israel joined himself into Baal Peor, and finally the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. What do we see here? Here's what happened. Israel was camped near Shittim, and on the top of the mountain in Shittim there was a temple to Baal Peor. It was a disgusting place of all kinds of sexual debauchery and deviant activities. And the Moabite women, stripped of all of their clothes... And they walked out in front of the men of Israel who hadn't seen their wives and their families for a long time. And they began dangling themselves like bait in front of the men of Israel. And the men of Israel began to watch. They began to consider and lower their standards until finally they began following the bait. And the women led them to the altar of Baal Peor on top of the mountain, which was a profane place. It certainly was not a place where God's people ought to be. Now, let's look at the process. First of all, these women called the men unto the sacrifices of their gods. The men lowered their standards. They said, well, maybe one time won't hurt, and they began following the bait. Number two, the Bible says the men did eat, or they ate what they should not have been eating. They entertained what was wrong, and what you entertain, eventually you will participate in. 
Finally, it says they bowed down to their gods, which means they began to accommodate what God despised and what God was against. Then the Bible says Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, which means they entered into moral and sexual defilement. What you get close to, eventually you will participate in. And that's what they did. They came close. They came so close that finally they joined themselves to it. What was once reprehensible, now they had fully entered into. They were endorsing it. They were embracing it, participating in it. And the result is the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel or their action incurred divine judgment. That's what happened here. They lowered their standards. They entertained what was wrong. They accommodated what God despised. They entered into moral and sexual defilement. And as a result, they were judged. Now, if you take all this together, we find out what was the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam said, hey, I can't curse them with divination. I can't curse them with the powers of the devil. So let's get them to curse themselves. Let's get them morally to morally surrender. They will curse themselves if they were morally surrender. Balaam knew that God would not tolerate this horrible act of disobedience. So he lured them out, tempted them to do what they shouldn't do, to embrace teachings and ideas and concepts that were foreign to the teachings of God. They begin to accommodate them. And finally, they so veered from the truth, they begin behaving just like the world. And as a result, God's judgment came on God's people. So this tells us the doctrine of Balaam was a doctrine of moral surrender. Now this is very important because next in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 15, Jesus is going to state that he is against the Nicolaitans. In fact, he's going to say he hates their deeds. He hates their teaching. That word hate is very strong. But what we find is this. Defective spiritual leaders in the city of Pergamum were saying, hey, let's not be so restrictive. Let's not live so separate. The world was calling. And these defective leaders were saying, why do we live separate? Let's involve ourselves a little bit in the world. Think like the world. Lower our standards. But Jesus knew if they did, the doctrine of Balaam would be intermittent implemented among them, and God's people would begin acting like the world, thinking like the world, behaving like the world, and then God would have to deal with it. Jesus was so against this. He said, this is evil. Instead of holding up a righteous standard, these errant leaders were endorsing mitigation with the world. But let me tell you, the gospel never gives us an option to live in two worlds, the world and in the church. We don't have that option. Negotiation and accommodation are foreign concepts to the New Testament. Jesus calls us to a life of separation. And in this chapter, you're going to find out Christ's sword was sharpened and he was prepared to take the necessary action needed to put a halt to the career of these false leaders. God loved the church so much that he warned these false leaders to repent. And if they were not willing to self-correct, then Jesus would surgically remove them. Remember, Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he did is what he's still doing. Jesus is still the head of the church. He still loves the church. He's still calling on people to repent. And if leaders do not repent, Jesus will put a plan into action to remove them from their influential positions of leadership. That's what we find in these verses. This is a great warning to all of us that are in spiritual leadership. But we're out of time. I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. Explore the Bible and the first century church with Rick Renner's book, No Room for Compromise. In this masterful hardback Bible study, Rick transports you to the first century and the life of the early church, exploring the relevance of Jesus' end-time message to the church of Pergamum then and how that end-time message is relevant today. On every page, Rick reveals the larger context of the book of Revelation and his appearance to the Apostle John, taking you on a journey through the first three centuries of Christian opposition within a pagan world. You'll be amazed to see how the early church thrived through the light, life, and power of Jesus Christ. This beautifully bound 400-page book can be yours for $80. Features on-location photography, added artwork, and historical illustrations that enhance the in-depth teaching. When you call or go online today, 
you can also get the 10-part teaching series, Christ's Message to the Church in Pergamum. As one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, the church in Pergamum was a light of faith in the pagan darkness. In this series, you'll see how Jesus' message of holding on to faith is just as relevant today as it was in the first century. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $20. Don't miss this special offer, No Room for Compromise, and Christ's Message to the Church in Pergamum. Call now or go to renner.org to order. This has been so good today as we've been studying Balaam in the Old Testament. And we've seen in the example of Balaam from Numbers 23, 23, the devil has no power against the people of God. The devil cannot curse who God has blessed. He cannot defy who God has not defied. There's no enchantment. There is no divination against the people of God. This means the devil really has no power against you. He just wants to convince you that he has power. You have authority over him. You have the ability to unseat the demonic master of the house. You can unseat Satan's power. He has no authority against you because you are in Christ, sealed, protected. It is amazing. Isn't that good news? Wow. But I want to remind you that I'm offering you my series called Christ's Message to Pergamum. It's a 10-part series based on these programs. comes with just a fabulous study guide. And we're also offering you my book called No Room for Compromise, Christ's Message to Today's Church. The director of the museum in Pergamum wrote one of the best and most comprehensive books ever produced on this subject. I believe that, and I believe this book will be a blessing to you, and you'll be very glad you got it for your home or for your office. But I want to pray for you. Father, we thank you for the power of the gospel. We thank you the gospel is the power of God to those that believe, and Lord, we're believing. So we expect the gospel to release its power in my life and in the life of my friend, in Jesus' name. Thank you for being with me today. And remember Ecclesiastes 8.4 says, where the word of the king is, there's power. You have the word of the king right there in your phone, in your heart, in your Bible. That is God's word, the word of a king. And if you'll embrace it and act on it, the Bible says it will release power in your life. I'll see you in the next broadcast. Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the Word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity.